Hey everyone, it's great to be here. My name is Rahul and I run the product team at Grammarly. And we're here to talk about the future of AI. But before we get started, I have a really important question to ask all of you. What do you call an AI that has learned how to take a picture of itself? Anyone? Anyone? Selfie aware. <laughs> get it? Selfie aware. I'm sorry, I, I'm famous, or I should say I'm infamous inside Grammarly for sharing terrible jokes. So I had to just get one in there. Um, sorry you had to hear it. But this is actually a weighty topic. And it's almost presumptuous of me to be up here talking about the future of AI. What does that even mean, and who am I to uh, have opinions on this topic? And spoiler alert, I do not have the answers. But what I'd like to do is talk to you about how we think about it at Grammarly, how I think about a way forward for us with all of the changes happening in the world of AI. And what I'd love is by the end of this session that we actually start a conversation. We start a conversation about how we can build AI to help us, not hurt us. A conversation about how we can use AI to increase our capabilities, not decrease them. And a conversation about how we can use AI to help ourselves, help express ourselves more creatively and authentically, not rob us of our voices. But in order to have this conversation, it's important to just ground us in a couple of uh, kind of key context setting points. The first is AI is the most transformational and foundational technological shifts in our lifetimes, maybe ever. It is already having massive impact across every industry you can imagine. For example, in manufacturing, AI is being used to de design better components. AI is being used to optimize global supply chains. If you look at healthcare, AI is working alongside radiologists and oncologists to detect and treat cancers earlier and more accurately than ever before. In medicine, AI is speeding up the drug discovery process, analyzing billions of compounds and pinpointing the areas of most promise. And in tech, AI is delivering new services, personalized services and new information that helps me be more productive at work and in my personal life. And we're just getting started. In the course of our lives, AI is gonna have a hand in helping us solve the biggest problems facing us. Things like global warming. And with the recent advances in large language models, AI is gonna help us with creative expression and translating high-level ideas into creative uh, artifacts that we could use and share. And that's awesome. I'm a tech optimist and I deeply believe in the power of technology to make people's lives better. In the course of my career, I've seen this. I've seen the rise of smartphones and how it's improved the lives and livelihoods of billions of people around the world. And AI, if anything, is gonna be orders of magnitude more impactful than that. So that's fantastic. But with great power comes great responsibility. And there's no question that the power of AI systems can lead to real harms. For example, AI-based recommendation engines have a dark side. They lead to all sorts of social evils, things like radicalization or addiction or decreased interaction in the real world as you get sucked into the vortex of these online connections. I mean, our brains are no match for these precisely engineered and optimized hits of dopamine that these AI systems can deliver to us. And as a parent of young kids, I worry about this. I mean, I want my kids to have access to all of the great services and information that these systems bring, but how do I deal with the harms? And AI systems make consequential decisions in our lives today. Things like making decisions and choices about who gets approved for a loan application, or making decisions about how we screen applicants uh, to uh, go through the job application process. And I don't know if you saw this, but John Oliver, the comedian uh, who has an HBO show, a couple of weeks ago, did a whole section on AI. And he actually dove into the use of AI in the job screening process. And there's lots of challenges with underlying bias in the training data. Um, and there's many issues, but if you haven't seen the show, I highly recommend it. It's on YouTube, watch it. It's, it's really funny and very insightful. 
But there's one thing from that show that really stood out to me, which is at one point, one of the CEOs of the service providers of job application screening services, his advice to job applicants was don't stand out. Don't be unique. Your job is not to stand out. Your job is to just get, get past the AI gatekeeper to get to the next level. And while that may be practical advice, that is so disempowering. And with this, all of the conversation about generative AI that, that's happening the last couple of months, that's happening here at South by Southwest, new concerns emerge. I mean, what happens to my future, my livelihood? Creative expression is such a key part of who we are as humans. So do we just cede that to an AI? So it's all very fuzzy. There's great promise. There's great peril. What do we do? Well, do we just shut it down because it's too risky? I don't think that's practical or feasible or even desirable. AI systems create a lot of good in this world. Do we just move full tilt ahead and say, let's prioritize velocity and innovation and hopefully nothing bad will happen? Well, that's not great. The harm is real and hope is not a strategy. So we need a more intentional way forward. And that intentional way forward starts with recognizing that we want AI to augment our potential, to help us do better. And we collectively can decide the future we want to build. So let's not give up this control and let's not have AI be done to us. Let's take control of how these systems are built and how they shape our lives and the role they play in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, with that control, there's a question. How do we think about it? How do we reason about it? How do we think about these systems, how to build them? What are the decisions we need to think about? And we have a framework that we use at Grammarly that I want to share with, here, share with you all here today. It starts from this belief that AI exists to augment our potential. It's something we call augmented intelligence. Augmented intelligence is the belief that AI is successful when it helps us, when it augments our skills, when it augments our intelligence, when it helps us achieve better outcomes. In fact, I wish, I really wish we could have a do-over and we could rename artificial intelligence to augmented intelligence. Who's with me? Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. I think we can do it. If enough of us rise up and make this change, I think we can do it. Artificial intelligence leads to all sorts of weird discussions around, is it conscious, is it sentient? Whereas I think augmented intelligence explains what we really want from these systems, which is we want them to help us. And so at Grammarly, that's a core belief. We want to enable augmented intelligence in the systems that we build and ship to our users. And to help us make decisions about how we build our products, we use something that we call the true framework. The T stands for trust, which is an investment in privacy and security. The R stands for responsibility, which is a focus on increased fairness and user safety. The U stands for user control, which is making sure that users have agency and autonomy throughout the experience. And the E stands for empathy, which is putting ourselves in the user's shoes and making sure that we are solving real user problems. And I'd actually like to walk through a case study with you all of how we use the true framework at practice in Grammarly. But to do that, let me take a brief detour and let me tell you a little bit about what we do at Grammarly. Our mission is to improve lives by improving communication. Communication is really hard to get right. We all communicate differently. We have different preferences and ways of communicating with each other. And with recent changes, things like just the sheer number of apps that we're using to communicate with each other, the rise of distributed teams, the rise of remote work, communicating well is not harder now than ever before. And all of this ineffective communication has a cost. In fact, a study we did about a year ago suggests that the average knowledge worker in the US spends about one day a week just dealing with the effects of ineffective communication. And I think all of us can viscerally understand and recognize what this means. Dealing with an email that wasn't very clear, 
trying to follow up with people in a way that's not productive, all of that stuff adds up to one day a week on average. And if you add that up across the US and all the knowledge workers, that results in a $1.2 trillion economic loss every single year, year after year, just in the US alone. So it's costly when we don't communicate well. But when we do communicate well, it is glorious. As individuals, we feel better understood. We feel a greater sense of belonging and connection with the people we're communicating with. And businesses are happy because they have an engaged set of employees who are in flow state, doing work that they enjoy doing, achieving better business outcomes, and helping your customers uh, be happier than ever before. In fact, communication is so central to how businesses run that I honestly believe that the businesses that enable effective communications, they're the ones that are gonna, actually are gonna succeed in the long run. So that's what we do at Grammarly. We enable individuals and businesses to communicate more effectively. And now um, there's been a lot of discussion about generative AI, and we've certainly been discussing generative AI internally at Grammarly. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is because just last week, we launched Grammarly Go. And that's Grammarly's take on generative AI and how to use generative AI uh, to enable better outcomes for our individuals and businesses that use Grammarly. And we use the true framework to bring Grammarly Go to life. This is just, this is top of mind for me because we just announced it last week. And so I'd actually like to walk you through exactly what we did to bring Grammarly Go to life by using this framework. So let's talk about trust. At Grammarly, we've invested for many years in user privacy and user security. And as a result of those investments, when we launch a new feature like Grammarly Go, we can make the same promise to our users we've always made. User privacy is really about what are we doing with user data? These are questions like, what data are you collecting? What are you using it for? How long are you gonna keep it? But really underneath all of those questions is really the key question, which is, are your incentives and my incentives are they aligned? And so at Grammarly, we've built a business to provide an unambiguous response to this question. We have a business where we only get paid, we make money only when someone pays for our service. So we use the data only to make the service better to improve the user experience. Whatever it is you're working on, just recognize that user privacy at its root is about aligning incentives. And so think about how you can express that alignment of incentives. If privacy is about aligning incentives, security is about keeping users and user data safe. And at Grammarly, we've invested for many years in a multi-layered security program, and we have a lot of third-party attestations, things like SOC2, ISO, HIPAA, just the alphabet soup of all of these different security attestations. These things don't happen overnight, and you can't really bolt it on after the fact. This actually requires long-term sustained investment. And with new technology, new technological innovations like large language models, new threat vectors emerge, like supply chain issues or model integrity issues. And so it's not just about getting these point in time attestations, but it's also about having a multi-layered portfolio approach to security. Things like having red teams that proactively seek out vulnerabilities in your systems. Things like having bug bounty programs. And so, it's really important to make these investments in user privacy and security from the get-go. It's very hard to bolt on after the fact. And so if you do it, you have a firm foundation on which you can launch new things like Grammarly Go. So Grammarly Go built on really years of effort that we've put in to enabling that foundation of trust. So that's trust, responsibility. With Grammarly Go, we are now using a large language model to generate text, and so we want to make sure that we understand and have a high degree of confidence in that model. So at Grammarly, for example, we've invested uh, in a number of different approaches, things like making sure we have a very rigorous quality evaluation process to evaluate model output, to making sure we have a very rigorous process to get high quality training data as input into these models, investments in 
classifiers and rules that can detect and take action on sensitive text, hate speech, bias, etc. And as a result of that, when we launch Grammarly Go, if the large language model generates some sensitive output, our classifier will catch that and we can take evasive action, like we will not show it to the user and protect our user from that harm. But a key part of responsibility is also recognizing that no matter what technical investments you make, you're never gonna get it 100% right. There's always gonna be unexpected things that crop up when you deploy this at scale. And so at Grammarly, what we do, for example, is we have a lot of different ways for our users to send feedback to us, to report issues to us, in product, contacting customer service, and a bunch of other things. And on the back end of that, we have a very rigorous and scaled operational process. So when we hear about something surprising that someone reported to us, we can very quickly take remedial action. And so responsible development really encompasses those two areas of development. Investing in the technologies to reduce bias, promote fairness, increase quality, but also recognizing that you're never gonna get 100% right. So what is gonna happen when someone reports something unexpected and what action are you gonna take? And are you geared up to take that action? So that's responsibility. Let's talk about user control. Now, with Grammarly Go, we are generating text on behalf of our users, so it's critically important that the user feels like this text that we're generating represents them, how they sound, their preferences, their voice. And so we built that into the flow from day one. Users decide what their voice is. They decide how they want to sound in a given context. And instead of getting boilerplate text, what you get is text that represents you, that you can feel proud of using and sending to communicate. And if you look at the user flows in Grammarly Go, if you download the product or look at some of the demos, what you'll see is the entire design and the entire user flow is based on guiding users, prompting users, but ultimately deferring to users to make the right choice that is right for them. And that's not an accident. That is a very deliberate, intentional design decision because we want to make sure that ultimately users are in control of the experience and they feel and they understand that they're in control of the experience. AI is not being done to them. They're deciding how to use this tool in their lives. And finally, empathy. Empathy is about making sure that you're solving a real user problem. And this kind of sounds obvious. Uh, of course, we want to solve real user problems. What else are we working on? But actually, it's quite easy to get distracted. I know this because this happens to me all the time. You can get distracted because there's a cool piece of new tech and you just want to send it over the wall to your users as quickly as possible. Or you can get distracted because someone else is doing something, you're looking over your shoulder and you're like, oh, those folks are doing something over there, let me do the same thing. Or there's some other complexity that's distracting you. So actually, focusing and having empathy for user problems does require continued focus and discipline. And at Grammarly, we have a lot of different ways to listen to user feedback. We conduct user research, we talk to businesses using Grammarly to understand what their problems are, and we ground our investments to just making sure that we are addressing those problems and not just doing things for novelty or because we just had some other reason to do it. Um, so as an example, uh, in Grammarly Go, there's a really cool feature where we allow you to do very quick responses to email. You get an email, you can quickly respond in a way that's contextually relevant, personalized, and you can just crank out responses very, very quickly. And that feature was built because we heard from all of our users that they're just struggling with dealing with the volume of email. I mean, I think all of us feel this pain, right? The pipe dream of inbox zero, <laughs> which is never gonna happen. And there's all this email, how do I keep, how do I respond to it in a timely fashion? And so we built this feature specifically to address that user pain point. So, so that's the true framework. That's how we made decisions about Grammarly Go, and that's what we enabled to bring Grammarly Go to life in a way that we feel confident will augment our users' capabilities and our users' intelligence. Now, I gave you a Grammarly case study. It seems very specific to Grammarly. 
But actually, what I hope is that you can look at this true framework and see how to apply it in your work, in your context. Whatever application you're working on, whatever industry you're in, how can you apply the true framework to your work? And if we had a world in which everyone applied the true framework, what might that world actually look like? Well, I think it's a world in which individuals would feel a greater sense of capability and accomplishment and greater sense of connection. I think it's a world in which we collectively would feel a greater sense of inclusion and belonging. And I think companies would achieve better outcomes when their employees work more effectively and efficiently. And I think it's a world in which AI systems would be deployed at scale to help users. Now, that's a world that I'd like to bring about. That seems like an awesome world to have, where we are getting help, we are getting augmented. And so let me leave you with this. We have the control, and we can decide how these systems get built and developed and scaled. So let's commit. Let's commit here and now to build systems that enable augmented intelligence. We are all leaders in technology, and we can make these decisions. Let's hold ourselves accountable to build AI in a way that augments human potential. Let's hold our industry accountable so that across the industry, we're building systems and deploying systems at scale that enable augmented intelligence. I mean, if we don't do it, who will? We all want to build a better future for ourselves and for our families and for our children with AI. Let's go make that true. Thank you.